Today is our last class. Um, the purpose of this last class is to both face the reality that we have been talking about this semester, the realities of widening inequality of income and wealth and race, but do it in a way that reality needs to be faced. That is not with great fear, not with negativism, not with a sense of defeatism, but really with a sense of optimism, inspiration, commitment. So today, we're going to be talking about where do we and you go from here? Uh, we're going to, I'm going to give you a very, very short cartoon summary of the vicious cycle of inequality that we are finding ourselves in, and then uh, talk a little bit about reset and renewal. And what does that mean? How do we begin to reset and renew the system? Uh, and then I want to talk about leadership and positive social change. Oh, yes, I want to talk about you, because you are very much central to this story. Uh, the system and the cartoon summary, and that says um, they got rid of the balances, now it's a system of checks and checks. Well, that's a cynical cartoon. But the cartoon version of what we've talked about in terms of the vicious cycle of widening inequality is that people with the right assets in terms of education, race, ethnicity, gender, skills, connections, family wealth, and health, uh, they get higher incomes in our system and increased wealth. Not all of them, but enough of them do that they affect the system, and this higher, these higher incomes and increased wealth mean they have more political influence including more pol influ political influence over how the market is organized. And again and again, we've talked in this class about how the key political decisions and the key economic decisions are intricately connected because the market itself does not exist out in nature. It is a function of human beings, decisions. And those decisions are Decisions usually by people who have some authority, judges, justices, people who are secretaries of cabinet departments, people who are presidents, people who are members of Congress, people who are legislators, all of them continuously are making decisions that shape and change the market. But they are subject to the political power and the political influence of great wealth. Not directly always, but we've talked about it in various ways. The market pre-distributes to people who often have a lot of power, and the richest withdraw their support for public investment and social insurance. People without the right assets, that is education, race, et cetera, they get lower incomes, lower wealth, indebtedness, and less social protection. Uh, and many face barriers of systemic racism. And others become angry at what they consider to be a rigged system. And in the ways we've been talking about it, of course, the system is rigged. And some become susceptible to the politics of resentment of racism, xenophobia, and demagoguery because they are trapped, because they are angry or ang anxious or frustrated. They don't see way out. And divisiveness increases, distrust mounts toward all institutions. This is a vicious cycle. 
And I don't want any of you in this class to take this as inevitable. An explanation is not a justification, and a description of what is is not a description of what could be. In fact, the way you get out of a vicious cycle, the way nations do, the way this nation, this culture, this society, any does, is reset and renewal and reform and change. And we're going to talk today about what that actually means. Nice words. There is in our society, in our culture, a tradition of positive social change. There are three elements. Now, we've talked a little bit about this before, but I want to go over them again. There are three critical elements of positive social change. One is a growing dissonance between the ideals and everyday reality. Dissonance. That is, you have some ideals about what a decent society looks like, feels like. But you walk to campus and you pass so many people who are homeless, for example. That is dissonance. That tension between what you understand is a decent world, a decent society, and what you experience in your daily life, that is the stuff out of which social change can occur. But it's not enough. There has to be widespread awareness of this growing dissonance. If only you or a few people are aware of it, it's not going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. And we'll talk today a little bit about widespread awareness. But that's also not enough. There's a third element of positive social change. And if you look at the history of positive social change, you see that third element is very critical. And that third element is a sense of efficacy, a capacity to narrow the gap between ideal and reality, a feeling that you have and that others have that it is possible to create a better world. Now, this may feel like airy-fairy, West Coasty stuff, but it's not. We have lived, I have lived, I'm old enough, I've had lived through several of these we call them movements. That's a sloppy word. I'm going to use it because we don't have a better word. But they are times and places where people join together. They organize. They mobilize. They energize to make changes. The movement against systemic racism is a movement in the sense that people have continued to work, and they've continued to work hard on it. As I think I've shared with many of you, my introduction to much of what we've been talking about this semester happened when I was a freshman in college. And one of the young men who had been my protector when I was about eight years old. Uh, he was a couple of, he was about five years older than me. Uh, you know, I was very short, I was picked on, I was bullied. He had been my protector. And then I discovered, although I had lost track of him for years, that by the time I got in college, I found out that he had been registering voters in Mississippi in 1964. And the Ku Klux Klan and the sheriff of Neshoba County, Mississippi, didn't want black people registered. 
to vote. And so my protector when I was a much younger kid, Michael Schwerner, along with two other civil rights workers, they were tortured and murdered. And when I found out that the person who had protected me from the bullies had been killed by the real bullies, it changed my life because I, I began to see bullying all around, economic bullying. Racial bullying, ethnic bullying, the bullying of men versus women, the bullying of transgender young people, the bullying of anybody who's different, who's other, who doesn't have the power. But these movements, the movement against racism, here is Lyndon Johnson with Martin Luther King Jr. behind him, signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And you go on and on and on. And the thing that is so important, this is the fight for gender equality. The, the thing that's so important to understand is that these fights don't end. There is no point where you can relax and say, oh, yes, the gap between our ideal and reality has already been overcome. Women have equal rights. No, they don't. Women, 120 years ago, 130 years ago, they started fighting for equal rights. And they have continued to fight for equal rights. And there is no end to that fight. Glass ceilings are broken, maybe, but there are new ceilings. Workers' rights. I was Secretary of Labor. I got very close to this. But I kept on seeing that, for example, child labor, which I thought we had outlawed years ago, But there were still examples of employers who were hiring children when children needed to be in school. There were still examples of so many workers who were being economically abused, and they needed to form unions. And it was hard. It was difficult for them. LGBTQ rights. It is hard for us to know and understand that just a few decades ago, if you were gay, you were violating the law. You could be arrested, and many people were arrested. And they weren't just arrested, they were assaulted, they were killed, they still are being assaulted, they still are being killed.